Hey everyone, Chad Cemetery is back. I'm your host, Deanna Chapman, and today I am joined by Brad C. Hodson to discuss the unfortunate Dark Tower movie. That's probably the best adjective for it. <laughs> I was watching it and I was like, okay, you know, I've heard this was bad because this was one I specifically did not watch when it came out because a lot of people were saying it was bad and I hadn't quite started this podcast just yet. So I wasn't really like into the Dark Tower story at all. I hadn't read any of the books. So it was one I was okay skipping at the time. But then with all of the negative reviews, I was like, oh, I'm just going to wait until I have to watch it for the podcast because I get the feeling it's not what I'm going to want to rewatch. And yikes. Yeah, I think the the best review I read about it was on uh, Roger Ebert's site. It said something like, uh, you know, had the opening line of the gunslinger, the man in black fled across the desert and the gunslinger followed. And then the review was like, you know, with this amazing opening line, Stephen King hooked millions of fans for a decades and decades long journey into this world with Roland the Gunslinger. And not only is the movie a mediocre movie, but it doesn't even try to fulfill the promise of that. And I think that kind of sums it up best. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I want to talk about the cast real quick before we dive into the story and everything, because I do think the cast is the most impressive part about this movie. But even then, you have Idris Elba as Roland, you have Matthew McConaughey as the man in black, you know, Randall Flagg, whatever you want to call him. He has like 2,800 names. And the two of them alone... I feel like should have been enough to make this movie work. And, you know, it's only about an hour and a half, which seems way too short for a Dark Tower movie. But because the cast is really so small, as far as the main characters go, you don't really know if, you know, you're going to have any supporting cast who really stand out. And this story... The way it's told in this movie doesn't really give much of a chance for that. You have, you know, Tom Taylor as Jake as well. And then everyone else is just really there and they don't all really have a purpose, you know? Yeah, even though they cast great actors. I mean, Catherine Winnick plays his mother. Yeah. And Jackie Earl Haley, you know, and it's just like they're kind of thrown aside. Yeah. It's definitely one of those movies where you wonder if there's a director's cut on the floor somewhere that might have some interesting meat to it. Yeah. Because the movie does feel just like it's it's racing from one plot point to the next. It's basically the structure of the movie is exposition, plot point, exposition, plot point, exposition, plot point. And that's it. <laughs> and it's, it's almost as though the filmmakers aren't interested in the material and they just want to race through with race through it all and, and just get it over with. Which is kind of crazy because you have big names behind this, you know, you have the screenplay that Akiva Goldsman was involved with, also produced by them and Ron Howard. And, you know, I'm not familiar with the director, but at the same time, I'm just kind of like, okay, there are a lot of familiar names involved in this cast and crew, and it just fails so spectacularly. <laughs> It feels like something that got noted to death, death the, at the studio level. Yeah. I read an interview recently with Ron Howard, and he said his biggest regret about that movie is that they didn't trust the source material, and that instead of running away from all the weirdness in the books, they should have just leaned into it. And I think that's, that's a big case. As you take this, you know, the Dark Tower novels – especially when you're doing a movie like this, where they're trying to pull from several books instead of just adapting the first book, it has so much interesting, unique, bizarre, original elements to it that you, you can feel while you're watching the movie that it probably scared the hell out of everybody involved with it. They, had, they weren't confident in how to adapt it, and so they just decided to not do those pieces. And so the, the kind of life and the flavor of it is just gone. I mean, the fact that, you know, it's, it's about rolling the gunslinger and we hardly see any gunslinging. <laughs> yeah, right. It's like one or two scenes that I recall. 
Yeah, and they're pretty lackluster too. Uh-huh. You know, and in the era where we have amazing like John Wick style gunfights, right? That's all they give us. But on top of that, too, just the whole Western feel. I mean, that's I think one of the the draws to the Dark Tower books is taking this what feels like an old West world and dropping fantasy and horror elements on it. And there was just very little in the movie that felt like a Western. I think there's there's one little town that they go to after Jake gets pulled into to Roland's world that almost has an old West vibe. Um, but that's it. You know, <laughs> then we're, then we're, we're spending most of our time in New York where, you know, it kind of felt like, uh, did you ever see masters of the universe? The 1980s Dolph Lundgren He-Man movie. I did not. That's basically, and it was a bad movie. Of course, you know, <laughs> I was a kid when it came out, so I watched it 87 times. But that's exactly what this thing felt like. Is just this, you know, we we have this fantasy property. We don't know how to adapt it, so let's just take the main character and pull him into our world and try to do a fish out of water thing. And it just was so bland as a result. Yeah, and even though it made money at the box office. Not a ton, but the budget was sixty six million. It made like one hundred and thirteen million, which, okay, at least it didn't lose money, you know, but I went to the Wikipedia page to look something up while I was watching this. And the first paragraph, you know, after the break where it gives you a little breakdown of who was in it, who was involved, it says, Intended as the first installment in a multimedia franchise, the film combines various elements from the eight novel series and takes place in both modern-day New York City and in Midworld, Roland's Old West-style parallel universe. The film also serves as a sequel to the novels. So it wants to be a first installment. It wants to adapt elements from all eight novels. And it wants to be a sequel. You got to pick one. <laughs> yeah. And that was probably part of the big problem with why it ended up just being this mediocre, middle-of-the-road thing is that they really didn't know what they wanted to do. You know, when I first heard the uh, the sequel idea, I was very intrigued by it because uh, you finished the novels, right? Yes. Okay, so spoiler alert for anyone listening who hasn't. Uh, at the end of the books, Roland basically, when he enters the tower, starts his journey all over again. But now there's something different. Now he has this horn that he'd lost in a battle. And I loved that idea that it's like, oh, so if the movie is going to be this journey to the tower that we left off with the books, which would give them a lot of creative license to, you know, make some match and do things differently and blah, blah, blah. I was very intrigued by that idea. I thought that was that was a very interesting uh, way to do an adaptation. Like it gives you a way to kind of gives you an easy out for satisfying fans when you do things different from the way the books did it. And again, they do nothing with that. It, it felt more like a marketing gimmick than it did any kind of storytelling device. There's also the fact that this was stuck in development hell for so long, because I believe it was 10 years before this movie even came out that people really started talking about a Dark Tower adaptation. And, you know, there's the unaired Amazon pilot out there. I have not seen it. I know screeners were sent out to a bunch of reviewers. So I've kind of skimmed some of the reviews on that. But I I want to try and find it at some point and just kind of see the differences because this movie tried to do too much. And, you know, I have the Stephen King at the movies book that kind of just gives a bunch of facts and whatnot on the movies. And it says that they wanted to start with the third book and then work their way backwards, but do it as a TV show. And I'm like, okay, you know, I'm all for doing different things with the Dark Tower, because I've actually really loved the comics that I've read so far, which are basically a good chunk of them are prequels to where we see Roland in his life during the novels. So they took an approach that stayed very in line with the universe King had built. And of course, it helps that Robin Firth was involved in the comics because she was an assistant (laughs) to King for quite some time. And I think this movie just needed someone like Robin or Stephen King himself kind of overseeing it and being like, no, this is not how we should approach this. Yeah. And, you know, that's kind of interesting to think about because, uh, you know, one of the reasons I think the, the Marvel movies are successful is Kevin Feige. Yeah. Uh, That no matter who's writing and who's directing, there's this, this guy who just oversees everything, who has this extensive comic book knowledge and, you know, can think like years ahead 
as to what possible stories could occur and how the characters will act and interact, etc. And so you get that that cohesiveness and that integrity uh, throughout the franchise. And so if you're trying to to build a franchise, especially one like this, I, yeah, I think having if you had someone like Robin Firth on board uh, as a guiding hand, it it definitely probably would have avoided a lot of these pitfalls. When I say a lot of pitfalls, there's a lot of pitfalls <laughs> in this movie. <laughs> yeah. So let's dive in because I already stated that it should have just picked one direction and gone with it instead of trying to be all the things all at once. So you know, you could see what elements they were pulling in. They were pulling in Wizard and Glass, they were pulling in the Gunslinger and, you know, bits and pieces from all of the other books. But did you feel like setting a good majority of this in New York was sort of one of the main downfalls of the movie? Absolutely. It would be like if Peter Jackson, when he did the Lord of the Rings adaptation, uh-huh. centered it around Tolkien in his office <laughs> or something. It, it it just so drags because again, the things in the novel, it, like the Western feel, the the building of Midworld, all the the bizarre elements that make up Roland's world is what draws you in. I mean, we don't spend in the books any significant time in New York. And to, well, in in the second book, when uh, Roland's going through the doors and entering people's heads, you know, he comes to our world a lot. The whole establishment of the world and this character has to occur in Roland's world. Mm-hmm. I think that was misstep one. I think misstep two, which ties into that, was making Jake the main character. Roland's a character who is cold and distant and removed, and. In order to access him, in order to to like him and want to follow him on his journey, I think you have to be up close and personal with him and learn why he is that way. And I think having Jake as the main character and then trying to meet Roland and learn about Roland and care about Roland through Jake, especially the way they handled it in this movie, is also one of the things that just makes it all fall apart. Because again, there's nothing that ties us, the audience, to this fantasy world. You know, the way the movie is structured, we're tied to New York, we're tied to this kid from New York, and we don't really care about any of this other stuff. Exactly. And for me, I was kind of waiting for that moment where maybe the focus shifted from Jake to Roland, but it never really did. And look, Jake is a fantastic character in the novels, but he is part of Roland's new quartet. And so he's not the sole focus in any of the books really as a whole, maybe bits and pieces of the books. He has his moments and he gets to shine, but it just felt like they maybe couldn't get locations long enough to have this set somewhere other than New York. I don't know, but because there's that 10 years where it kind of bounced around from a bunch of different groups of people, it's hard to know, you know, if anyone else's plan would have been better. Obviously, like I said, you have the unaired Amazon pilot, which is possibly one of the biggest what ifs as far as King adaptations go. Yeah. Yeah. If you ever get your hands on that, by the way, please send me a copy. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I will see if I can manage to find that somehow. But I think You know, this movie had potential because of the cast, but the way the story was ordered and written, it just didn't come together at all for me. And I really feel bad that I disliked this movie so much. It's by far one of the worst adaptations for me. And I think because you have names like Idris and Matthew McConaughey, you're expecting this big, like, passion project almost from the two of them, because the budget was not massive for this kind of movie. And again, you know, like we were saying about the the amazing cast for the smaller characters that they gave nothing to do. I don't feel that Idris had anything to work with. Like this iteration of Roland was so surfacy and flat and shallow and he's such an amazing actor i mean i'm a huge fan of his going back to luther yeah same and he just had nothing to do he was basically set dressing you know he walked around with some guns on his hip and 
you know, that was kind of it. They needed this movie to sell some trench coats. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was just one big trench coat marketing. <laughs> and then on the flip side, I felt Matthew McConaughey actually needed to be reined in. Yes. So that was, again, like something I was excited about when I first heard details about this movie was casting him as the man in black. I think that's perfect casting. But then I don't know if it was his choice or if it was the director but the way he played the man in black, there was almost like this faux British voice he was trying to do. <laughs> Whereas it's like, no, no, if you cast Matthew McConaughey in that role, especially because he is Randall Flagg, like you, you go through and read the stand, like you want Matthew McConaughey, you want the Southern, slightly white trash, like off kilter, a little crazy McConaughey and trying to turn him into this, you know, generic Star Wars villain is basically what it felt like, really sucked anything interesting out of The Man in Black. If you're going to have Matthew McConaughey play the character that way, he has to have other characters he can bounce off of. But because yeah. of how Roland is, you know, his personality is, he's not that character for that kind of representation of The Man in Black. And obviously... Jake spends a lot of this movie not really knowing what's going on and, quite frankly, looking terrified, <laughs> you know, a lot of the time, which when you read the books, you come to know that Jake kind of grows out of that and he does so fairly quickly. So you just feel like these characters are well casted, but the stuff that makes them these characters that we've grown to love throughout the eight books, nine, if you count the stand, it's just not there. Yeah. You know, in, in Roland's case, we don't, and this is again, a problem, I think by making Jake the point of view character, we don't understand Roland's determination. We don't understand everything that Roland's gone through. Um, I mean, it's very important. You get all this in the first book. This isn't stuff that's even like peppered throughout the series. Uh, when we meet Roland, it's not very long in the books until we learn about the fall of Gilead, mm -hmm. you know, what happened with his mother and his father and Martin and, you know, his rite of passage and all this, like we get this sense of somebody who's gone through a lot of horrible things. And the only thing he has left is tracking this man down, making him pay and then going on to the dark tower. When Jake comes into his life in the books there, Jake represents this other path he could take, you know, that he could give up that, and maybe develop relationships with people, which of course becomes a big theme for the whole series. You know, so that becomes a very powerful, important moment, especially the choice he has to make later with Jake when he's close to catching the man in black. All right there in the first book. In this movie, we don't get to know Roland well enough to get any of that from his character. And as a consequence, the introduction of Jake into Roland's life means nothing. One of the things that Roland is best at in the novels is his ability to tell stories and recall so many details from his past. Obviously, we're relying on him to give us an accurate representation of those, but because there is no other representation, we never really know. But it's always implied that his memory is really, really good. And you don't really see any of that in here. So it doesn't really give you a reason to care about most of these characters. It does give you a reason to care about Jake because you see the loss he suffers. You see him going through this thing that his stepdad clearly doesn't believe and how he can be abusive and all of this stuff. So you do have this sympathy for Jake, but outside of that, they didn't make me care about any of the characters, really. Of course, you feel for his mom because, you know, the man in black just comes and kills her. You don't feel bad about the stepdad. <laughs> yeah. You know, kind of going back to, it seemed like they're trying to do several things. There's very much a, a feel throughout this movie that Jake was supposed to be, that it was like a chosen one story, right? You know, making Jake into a breaker, that they want to take Jake and, you know, use him to break the beams, et cetera, et cetera. And that he's got these latent psychic powers. And it felt very much like a young adult chosen one story that Jake's going to be the one who has the power to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, and then Roland would be his guardian or, or some such. And that's um, at some point in the development process, they 
lost the payoff to that. <laughs> there's there's a lot of setup that occurs in the movie heading in that direction, and then it just never goes anywhere. Yeah, I always try to point out things I do like, even though I did not like this movie as a whole. We talked about how well cast it was, and I think there was one scene in particular that stood out to me, and it was when Roland was teaching Jake how to shoot. Mm -hmm. That's what we needed more of. Yes, exactly. We needed more of that connection between the two of them. You know, you have Jake kind of trying to teach Roland things while they're in New York, but it was that moment where you felt that these two characters understood each other, and we just didn't get any more of that, really. I didn't feel it anyway, outside of that scene. And it's it's a shame on many levels, because not only do we not get more interaction, meaningful interaction between these two characters, uh, that scene felt like the gunslinger. Yes. That was the first, one of the first moments in the movie where it's like, okay, this feels like the world of the books now. This feels like we're getting, even if we can't see Roland fighting, we're getting his expertise yep. right now on gunslinging. Another couple of scenes like that, and I think it really could have elevated the movie. I totally agree. And I probably don't have a whole lot to say about this one. Some of the CGI, too, just didn't look fantastic. And, you know, I actually just went and rewatched the first It movie, both of which came out in 2017. And there were a couple CG things in that that didn't quite hold up either. But in this, you know, the portal and everything, I was like, I feel like this just needed to look better as well, considering how important the Dark Tower is in the Stephen King universe. Yeah, and I think part of that uh, was, again, running away from the source material because when you read The Gunslinger, and look, I'm all about film adaptations making different choices. It's yeah. a different medium. There's tons of different reasons that go into it. Some things that were wonderful on the page just don't work that well on screen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so like I said earlier, I was actually kind of excited when I first heard about all this stuff. When you read the book, there's this, it's not only structured like a movie, you know, because uh, as King has famously said a dozen times, you know, he got the idea because he went to watch, I think, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly while he was reading Lord of the Rings. And so it, it very much feels structure-wise like a Western film already in the book. Like, I think you could just shoot the book and you would be fine. but. Also with that is that whole idea of the spaghetti Western. Like if they from the get go had said, we're going to make a Western that would automatically dictate the look of the film. And it would have been an interesting look. You know, I mean, you just, when you pick up the book, even that first line, the man in black fled across the desert and the gunslinger follows, you can almost immediately see that in your head. You know, this like 70 millimeter wide shot of a desert and, you know, the silhouettes of, of Roland and the man in black, you know, moving across this heat baked land. I mean, it's, it's right there. And they did none of that. It just has generic movie feel. Like it felt like something that would have been released as a throwaway movie in the summer of 94. <laughs> you know, like, oh, we'll just, we'll get this out of the way. Maybe we can sell some toys before we move on to, you know, Godzilla or something this year. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's really unfortunate that I think a lot of people agree with us and did not like it. Maybe they weren't quite as harsh as I was on it, but it just fell so flat. It was almost like watching one of the 80s adaptations that was more derivative than an actual adaptation. Yeah. With a higher quality, though, because, you know, this definitely had more than, you know, the Mangler 2 did for a budget. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which I suppose that might have been the 90s, but still, you know, there's definitely, like, lower quality King adaptations that you can tell with the look and the feel of them, but they have this sort of charm to them for a handful of them or more than a handful of them that this movie just didn't have to save it. Yeah, I mean, you, you look at something like... um I don't know why, but I recently watched The Night Flyer uh, with Miguel Ferrer. 
Yeah. And, um, you know, very low budget. It's, it's got a lot of, you know, some of the, the other actors in it are really hammy. There's not a lot of, you know, great cinematography or anything, but like you said, there's a charm to it. And I think the charm comes from just leaning into the source material because it's all there on the page. And so even if you're approaching it in a film that's not done well, I think that charm shines through. Um, and I think that's definitely one of the missteps with something like this is the more you deviate from the source material, the more you lose that charm. So if you're not bringing anything to the adaptation uh, worthwhile, then it falls apart, you know, and some adaptations have deviated greatly and been phenomenal movies still. I mean, The Shining probably being the biggest example of that. Terrible at following the source material, but a fantastic horror movie. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's because you there was there was a film that they wanted to make. They mm -hmm. had something they wanted to do and something they wanted to say. And in this, it's it's the opposite. You don't feel that anybody involved had anything to say that they they didn't know what they were doing. They were just like, "Hey, we have a hot property. Let's adapt it." And that was kind of the extent of it. Yeah. Like I said, I don't have a whole lot to say about this one, unfortunately, because... It's hard to go into. It was very surface level. Yeah. It's a very shallow movie. I, I remember we went to see it on opening night, and I went with my brother-in-law and two friends of mine. My, my brother-in-law had never read the books, uh, but was a movie fan. You know, just loves everything, like goes to see everything. My two, two friends had read the book series. And it was really interesting in that, like, my brother-in-law and I both hated it. So him knowing nothing about the books, he just thought it was a horrible movie. My two friends who came with us who had read the book series actually liked it. I think maybe a function of that might have been that they had spent so long reading these books, especially because you read some of them when they came out. Like, yeah. I remember I read Wastelands when it came out and then had to wait 10 years for Wizard and Glass, you know. Um, of course, I was way too young to be reading Stephen King, but I did anyway. Uh, but, um, you know, you spend that long with the characters. I think it's just, it, it touches you in a way just to see any aspect of that on the screen. But I did find that fascinating that, you know, they liked it. Me being a massive fan of the books, hated it. And my brother-in-law, who knew nothing about the books, absolutely hated it. I think he hated it more than I did. <laughs> So it just, it doesn't work as a movie. And I think the only thing Stephen King and Dark Tower fans could get out of it are just the references. You know, like when you see the picture of the Overlook Hotel in the doctor's office or, you know, just these little things where it's like, oh, I know that. That ties into, you know, this, that, and the other, all the, all the, the Easter eggs. And that's really the, I think, the only reason to watch this movie, <laughs> as horrible as that is to say. Yeah, and it just kind of felt like there wasn't that sort of passion behind it that you get with some of the lower budget stuff that at least still makes it enjoyable. Because I feel like with some of the 80s and 90s stuff that was low budget, especially, there's a passion behind it, or it's just so absolutely crazy, like Maximum Overdrive, <laughs> that you at least enjoy watching it. But then there's just, I want to say, a few adaptations that are just not fun bad movies they're just bad bad movies <laughs> yeah and it's again i think i think it's the ones that are just money grabs like hey we have the rights to this property yep we we should exercise them and make a dollar and yeah i think those are the ones that fall apart and that's exactly what this felt like it just it felt like a felt like a movie made by committee you know that you had 12 people in a room and everybody being like like oh here's my idea and i don't want you to do the idea you just said and so instead of having any kind of vision, it just ended up in, in this middle of the road, mediocre state when it was finally completed. Yeah. Well, Brad, I think we can give some quick ratings here and wrap this up because it sounds like we're pretty much on the same page with this one. I felt bad giving it a one and a half, but that is what I gave it out of five. <laughs> yeah. I might give it a two just because it's competently made in in the fact that like, you know, it looks like a movie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that's about the best you can say about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's just one of those ones I definitely will not be 
revisiting. And, you know, there are a lot of the adaptations that I probably won't revisit. And I know that once I'm cut up, I'm actually going to just take a little break, you know, kind of clear my mind of all of the Stephen King stuff that I've spent the last three years yeah. reading and watching, and then maybe kind of return to some things here and there, because I'll go back and I'll look at my ratings for some things and I'll be like, okay, was I just too excited about that movie at the time? And, you know, rated it higher than I would have if I wasn't like anticipating it? Or did I already know that it was going to be bad? So I was a little too harsh on it kind of thing. So we'll see, but definitely won't be revisiting this one, I don't think. Yeah, I'll put this in. Uh, it's funny, I think the last movie we talked about on here was Cell. And I would put these kind of neck and neck. Yeah, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I will say I uh, I have a soft spot for bad movies. I, I enjoy watching bad movies. But in, in that respect, like, neither of these movies were bad enough to be funny. Yeah. Which is also horrible. Like, they, they're just there. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> Yeah, it's not like either had like terrible gore effects that you could laugh at or anything like that. It was just bleak. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like you said, it just it made it a completely unfun experience. That not only are they not good movies, but there's there's no fun in them, there's no charm. There's very little to walk away and say, well, at least they nailed that. Yeah, two casts just completely squandered, honestly. <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting because Cell had an amazing cast. Yeah. And yeah, again, just completely down the toilet. Truly wild how some of these things happen, especially as recent as both of those movies have been, you know? <laughs> you would think they were from, you know, a time period where they didn't have a lot of budget and didn't have high end equipment and things like that. Obviously, The Dark Tower does look better than Cell, but, you know, Brad, thank you so much for coming on to talk about The Dark Tower. What a stretch this has been for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for having me on. At least if I, I'm going to set through these things, I get to complain about them afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you will be back for some bonus episodes down the line. So I look forward to talking to you about hopefully things that are better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to those those bonus episodes. I think that'll be really fun. All right, that does it for this episode of Chat Cemetery. You can support the podcast on Patreon for a dollar a month. You'll get a thank you on the show for $2 a month. I will send you a Chat Cemetery sticker. And if you want to follow us on social media, you can do so at Chat Cemetery on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You could also rate and review the show. That's a huge help. And as always, thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.